All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to your course, uh, AI for Art, Aesthetics, and Design and Creativity. Uh, today, we have a very special um, lecturer, AJ. Uh, he has been at MIT, just like you, for his undergrad. I got to uh, know him when he was here, and uh, he's very active have been running uh, the ML groups and um, sometimes chatting with me about, you know, these topics of creativity and AI and art. Um, I think that this is very exciting. He's going to tell us about his journey and uh, his new work. Um, I will let uh, him to, you know, start the discussion. Uh, AJ, one of the things that I always ask is that if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a little more about what inspires you to work in this area. Sounds good? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work I've done, some work that's happening in the community around 3D content creation. Um, but first about my journey. Yeah, I was at MIT for my undergrad. Um, and I was part of what is now called the AI club. And then we called it the machine intelligence community. Um, in my undergrad, I did research um, in a couple of areas, but mostly actually in compilers. So a little distant from what I do now, um, more on the high performance computing side and performance engineering, but I had experience with self-driving cars and generative models for self-driving applications during undergrad and really fell in love with that topic. How do we reason about uncertainty? How do we model complex data distributions and predict the future? Um, like for example, predicting the behavior of vehicles. And that led me down the path of working on generative models in my PhD. And these generative models are, um, these days the state of our generative models are parameterized by deep neural networks, which try to fit large data sets, try to estimate correlations between different variables. And these could be all types of different data modalities like images, they could be trajectories or behaviors like I worked on, um, audio, video. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about 3D objects. And so that's kind of what inspired me. At the time I was interested in uncertainty estimation, but these days I just really like the tangible results you can get out of generative models, novel samples and novel designs. It's very fun. I got to look at pretty pictures all day. Um, so my research interest, like I mentioned, is around generative models. We've done some work in um, denoising autoencoders. How do you generate images with these denoising diffusion probabilistic models? That's purely in the 2D setting, though it's been extended to other domains. Over the past about year and a half, I've also been doing a lot of work in 3D reconstruction and inverse graphics. So how do we take images? and try to infer a scene from them or generate in the 3D space. And sorry, kind of- uh, Sorry, AJ, interrupting you. Uh, it seems that some of the students want the transcription to be on, is that okay? That's fine. Okay, excellent, thanks. Um, and building off of that performance engineering background I had from MIT, I also did a lot of work in the intersection of machine learning and programming languages at the, more of the start of my graduate school. And I would summarize kind of my, my research interest as making it easier to create creative content, especially with AI tools. And to provide some background for today, I'm gonna to discuss different types of scene representations. And what I mean by this is how do we encode the geometry and color of a scene in some um, format that we can work with digitally. And there's this very long history of this, um, particularly from the graphics literature. On this slide shows some different representations of geometry that you'll be familiar with some of them. 2.5D might include RGBD images, like a photo plus a depth scan. And they're point clouds, meshes. Meshes are the most common representation used in graphics applications, but they can actually be challenging to work with in a learning context. Um, so in, our focus in the learning context will be on the volumetric approaches. These can be very easy to train. You can kind of think of a, at least a voxel grid as a classifier, mapping each point in space to whether it's part of the object or not, whether it's occupied or not. Um, more recently, there's been a significant amount of interest in 
neural scene representations, sometimes called implicit neural representations, that define the geometry of the object with a function. That could be a distance function, so a network mapping from coordinates to the distance to the nearest surface. And these can be a lot easier to optimize. Um, these neural scene representations can also compress the data significantly compared to explicitly representing the geometry of the scene. So we'll be focusing on that direction. And in particular, we're gonna be discussing a model called neural radiance fields I'll get to in a second. And they address this problem of view synthesis. So how do we take some sparsely sampled input views of, an, of a scene and then construct a representation of that scene's 3D geometry and color in a way that allows us to render it from new perspectives. These are some example works. You, know, you can represent the scene as a multi-plane image. So instead of a flat grid of RGB values represented as multiple planes, and that allows very quick um, rendering from new perspectives. Neural volumes is an approach from Facebook that has an encoder decoder structure, take some input images, encode them into a latent space, kind of a 3D latent space and decode it out to images with volume rendering. Neural radiance fields have really been very popular over the last two years due to their simplicity and um, quality of the results they can generate. So here's an example scene of, that's um, captured on the Berkeley campus. Some photos of the scene are captured, for example, with an iPhone. I believe these are captured with an iPhone. And then poses for each photo are estimated. And this neural scene representation called the neural radiance field is estimated off of those images. What's really nice is once we estimate the representation of the scene, we can render it from novel viewpoints and kind of smoothly interpolate these sparsely sampled views. So the scene is only very sparsely observed from discrete points, what if you as the user want to make a photo from a new perspective? Um, there's some interesting things to note about this rendering. Notice the specularities on the surface. So we're not just modeling the diffuse light, we're also modeling how the light reflected back at the user depends on the viewpoint of the camera. As you shift your head, the scene will change. Um, this is particularly visible on very shiny surfaces like the glass or metal of the car. A neural radiance field, uh, yeah, it really is amazing and um, really captured the attention of a lot of people. And so this neural radiance field and view synthesis field has grown very quickly and there's still a lot of problems to be solved. One very interesting thing that these neural scene representations bring to mind is that we're encoding a scene in the neural network's weights. So instead of explicitly encoding the geometry of the scene via points or meshes, lists of triangles um, or voxel grids, it's encoded um, into this small multi-layer perceptron. So maybe this is a half a million parameter network, just some stacks of dense layers. It's representing a function mapping from 3D space coordinates, X, Y, Z. This is in the scene, X, Y, Z coordinates and a viewing direction. So what is the angle of the camera in order to model those view dependent effects? The neural network then predicts at this coordinate, what is the color of the scene? And then it's density, sigma. So this density is something like how solid is the object there, how much light will be um, absorbed. Rendering is done by ray tracing. The, this is not exactly what would be done in most graphics applications, like uh, real-time ray, ray tracing, because we've kind of encoded the light being reflected at any given point um, back towards the viewer into this function. So we don't have to scatter light through the scene. Um, the viewer will cast a ray from their camera through the pixel, this is the image plane, into the scene, and then query the neural network along the ray. These are different 3D coordinates in the scene. The color of the rendered pixel will then be some accumulation of the colors along that ray. And in order to determine the color and the density along the ray, each of these coordinates is passed to the MLP as a very large batch. And we get a color and density for each coordinate and then can compose them with alpha compositing into a color. Um, there's some subtlety to this compositing. This is called uh, the volume rendering equation because um, you not, so, so this equation is actually pretty simple. So this is the density predicted. This is the camera origin and it's displaced some steps along the ray. 
And so the neural network will predict what is the density of the scene at that point, but it also predict what is the color. And then we're integrating this color along the ray weighted by its density. But we also have to weight it by transmittance, which is roughly speaking, um, how much light is transmitted from the viewer to that point along the ray. Because it, once we've accumulated enough density, then objects farther back in the scene will not be visible and be occluded. This equation for color um, conditioned on coordinates is differentiable with respect to the parameters of sigma and C. So sigma and C will be this neural network. Because this is fully differentiable, it's relatively easy to optimize. Instead of optimizing the scene geometry, we'll instead optimize the weights of this neural network in order to get some desired colors. So this might be the sparsely observed viewpoints, two viewpoints. Let's render the color according to the neural scene representation and then try to optimize the network so that it matches the observed views pixel by pixel. So, you know, then, then it might take a minute to wrap your head around, but it's actually it's like pretty simple. We have this one MLP that encodes a scene, lets us render viewpoints differentially, and we'll optimize the scene so that it matches the input views. And that's why it's inverse graphics. We're going from the 2D space to optimize for the underlying 3D representation that will reconstruct those views. I'll now talk about, um, are there any questions about that, first of all? Um, can you, uh, could you talk about like how the points are, let's say, uh, used for the neural net? I, I can't, let's say, see it uh, like directly. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean I, I get the uh, high level idea, but uh, uh, could you talk about like how those points are let's say, fed into the net? Yeah, so you could consider um, constructing an MLP with five dimensions as input, just you know five inputs, and then through uh, four outputs on the layers, and then intermediate features or whatever hidden dimension you want. So in, in NERF, it's two fifty six. That would be one approach, and it does work. But then you get actually quite blurry um, reconstructions of the scene if you directly feed in input coordinates, as these are just floating point numbers, three D coordinates in doing that direction. Um, but Instead, what is used in this um, neural radiance field is a sinusoidal positional encoding, so a frequency-based encoding. Um, if you're familiar with the transformer positional encoding, uh, this, is, this is a common approach where continuous values like coordinates or time steps are encoded um, using a Fourier representation. So you take sign of various scaled values of the input coordinates. And that lets the network model high frequency detail. So instead of kind of memorizing a function from each spatial coordinate, it can model um, good frequencies of the underlying signal if you use the sinusoidal embedding of it. But so that, that kind of just projects this five dimensional input into some higher dimensional space before feeding it to the MLP. I see. And there's no, let's say, um... I guess filtering done uh, before, I mean, uh, applying it to the net. So it's so just, yeah. just transforming certain, uh, I guess, components, but not doing some, I guess, post-processing before putting it into, or let's say compression or something like that. Uh, no, not really compression. There's some few, um, like coordinate transform because you'll do this computation in a particular coordinate frame. Um, there is some subsequent work which we actually build upon that does a uh, pre-filtering of the input coordinates. So instead of encoding all the frequencies of the input coordinates, they'll be blurred depending on how far away from the camera you're querying. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's a subsequent work to NERF that reduces aliasing. Yeah, I see. And the network is just like fully connected. Uh, yeah, just a, just a fully connected network. Okay, Super cool. simple. yeah, thank you. Yeah, one more thing that I wanted to mention here for students is that there is a difference between how you train this model versus the models that so far you have seen for, for instance, classification. For instance, if you want to train a model for a truck, what you do is you get a lot of images of different trucks in different lightings and different um, you know, models and things like that, and then feed it to your network. However, 
In this case, you are taking lots of images of the single truck, single scene, and you are trying to reconstruct that scene. Uh, so you said big difference between, you know, what we are used to doing and what we see in NERF. Yeah, absolutely. I, I kind of see it as instead of, uh, the, the NERF is representing a single C. And so instead of representing explicitly, we're representing it with a neural net with a function, um, but it doesn't generalize. It, it interpolates these input views. And um, you know, there's a catch to that, which is that in order to fit into the neural radiance field to a single scene, it generally needs a lot of data. Um, so while these views are sampled sparsely, discreetly, and there'll be large regions of space where we don't have um, an image taken from that perspective, still to estimate a, a multi-view consistent radiance field, experiments in the paper used a large number of images per scene. That's a little bit impractical. So for these synthetic scenes, this is one synthetic scene that's rendered in blenders. So we're able to get, they were able to get out hundred images of each scene and fit the neural radiance field on it. For those outdoor scenes I showed earlier, like that uh, red Toyota car, um, I think it's a fewer, maybe 20 images, but still that's a lot to capture with a handheld camera. And in the first work I'm gonna talk about, we improve the data efficiency of the neural radiance field training process. So instead of using, let's say, 100 images on this Lego um, scene, we used eight photos taken from randomly sampled viewpoints. In the neural radiance field training process, we would take, um, we would know the pose of each image. This can be estimated with a system like CallMap. It's really common in the 3D graphics and 3D computer vision community. It's given some. Uh, images estimate their camera poses with correspondence finding. Then the neural radiance field loss renders an image or renders some rays from the same pose as the input. Then computes a mean squared error loss. So it's pixel wise error. The reason that this loss can be used is because we know the camera pose. We're able to render out the scene from the exact same pose that the observer took the photo. If the camera pose is shifted, in the rendering process, then the um, reconstructed image and the true image won't align pixel wise, and we'll learn some inconsistent geometry. And so this is done at all of the observed camera poses. And this is why the neural radiance field needs so many photos. It, if there's no observed photo, then it doesn't have the ability to compute a loss from a given perspective, which means that it could overfit to the input views. It, this, this representation mapping from coordinates to colors is very flexible. One possible degenerate solution would be to put a billboard in front of each camera, just a poster board, you know, off of the highway, right in front of your camera containing the image that's observed, rather than learning a consistency in geometry. And there's other ways that you can get artifacts. This is just described as a shape radiance ambiguity in the NERF++ paper. Essentially, um, we could either reconstruct the shape correctly and then have relatively constant radiance from different cameras, or we could encode each image into the view dependent coordinate of the network. So because the network depends on the camera position, it's able to memorize potentially um, the photo taken from each camera. When the neural range field is trained with 100 views, it gets really crisp reconstructions. This is a hot dog scene, synthetic scene, um, where we render out the views in Blender. Then the neural radiance field, when it's trained with only eight views, only matches pictures close to the training data. When you move the camera further away from the observed images to try to extrapolate, then there'll be a lot of artifacts. Uh, if you regularize the neural radiance field a little bit and simplify it, it can learn um, more consistent geometry, but there still are a bunch of artifacts in the reconstruction. Um, I'll skip over this. So in our work, we add an additional loss to the neural radiance field training. We keep using the uh, NERF mean squared error loss is called a photometric loss on the observed views that are sparse. But then our work diet NERF adds an additional loss at unobserved positions. So because we have this neural radiance field um, at any iteration during training, we're able to render out uh, novel views even before the scene has converged. It's a little silly that 
in, in NERF, we're not able to constrain these input views because as a person looking at, you know, okay, let's say that our estimate of the scene's geometry gives us these renderings. This is the observed rendering. We as people can still look at these photos and, and derive some loss signal. Okay, I mean, the input view should be a lot, uh, is a lot sharper than my current estimate of the scene. There's a little red light at the top of the, the uh, truck, but there's no light on top of these reconstructions. Based on this principle that um, you can compare views at different camera positions as a person by comparing their semantics, like, you know, it's a bulldozer, a bulldozer is a bulldozer from any perspective. We propose to add a loss in feature space using some visual encoder each of the input views is represented uh, in a feature space. And then instead of computing the loss in pixel space, Dynerf will compute a loss in feature space. And that allows us to regularize the scene from any perspective during training. Uh, we call this a semantic consistency loss since we're making sure that these semantic features, things like object identity, object color, are consistent across views. And over the course of training, this improves the results. So the loss that NERF used was this mean squared error loss. And then we're adding this semantic consistency loss where some encoder thi, some neural network, um, encodes rendered images, and then we compare them in the feature space. The, we do have to sample camera poses in order to render this. So there's just some prior distribution over camera poses. Um, the choice of that feature, phi, is really, really important for the results because we want it to be uh, consistent across viewpoints. So it should really encode the object's identity and properties about the object rather than low level details, like the exact pixel colors. And it, motivated by that, we use a network called CLIP. And this is a, from last year. Um, it's a representation of images and text. So the representation of an image is learned such that it has an aligned representation with an associated caption. The data that CLIP is trained on is a very large data set of 400 million images that have associated captions crawled from the web. And the clip model has really led to an explosion of work in the AI art community. It's really powerful. It's trained on such a large amount of data that we're able to um, prompt it with topics that you know you wouldn't find in a narrow data set. It also, by learning to match images to this text, we'd hope to learn some very useful features about an image. For example, in captions, you can encode classes of objects, just like ImageNet labels. You can also encode a lot of other details like um, the scene rather than just the foreground object. You can encode things about pose of the underlying object, like a, a sitting person, a standing person. And that should be encoded in the representation learned by the network if it's able, going to be able to match images against their associated caption. So the training objective is encode a bunch of images, encode their captions, and then try to match images with their true caption. CLIP was originally used for discriminative tasks, object classification in um, a prompting fashion. So if you want to classify photos of food, the authors of CLIP constructed a bunch of captions templatized with the desired object category, a photo of guacamole, a photo of ceviche, and then the class label is given by the um, caption with the ma best match with a given image. The property we're particularly interested in in this 3D reconstruction context is whether the representations of the images are consistent across views. That's what we call semantic consistency in the work. What this plot is showing is that um, the cosine similarity of embeddings from the image encoder of CLIP within a particular scene from different camera poses is highly similar. So very high similarity in feature space within a scene across different perspectives, low similarity across scenes at um, different perspectives. So because uh, images are 
very similar in Clip's feature space, very different in pixel space, we're able to maximize feature space similarity of Clip and get some useful loss. Now what you've been waiting for the results. This is Nerf trained on eight views when it's simplified. And then here is it trained with our additional semantic consistency loss. A bunch of near field artifacts in Nerf, but when we add in this feature space loss, it removes a lot of those artifacts. Because those artifacts aren't um, plausible, they reduce the semantic consistency. Cool. I'm um, going to go on to the next work, but before I do, anyone have questions? Uh, I have one question, which is with regards to using Clip. Are you able to access the uh, the text as well that Clip generates, or are you able to decode it in some way and actually access how the Clip how Clip uh, looks at the inputs? Um, just in terms of explainability, I thought it could be yeah, sounds really interesting. Yeah, that's a very good question. So in this work, we're not actually using the text encoder. We'll see that in the next work. Um, the text encoder is just used for pre-training clip in, in die and nerf. So we're only using this image encoder because then the motivation for that is that the uh, neural radiance fields are motivated by the view synthesis problem. So there's no text caption associated with the data. They just have a couple of pictures. So we only needed to use the image encoder. Um, that said, some artists have tried to take clip and use it to create a captioning model. So how do you, if you have a model that can match images against captions, can you actually synthesize captions that best match a particular image? It's a challenging discrete optimization problem because you're searching for a textual caption that'll maximize some neural networks output score. And that is basically a black box optimization problem. My impression is that automatic captioning with clip doesn't work too well. It's really good at selecting an associated caption out of a list of candidates. And that's how we're able to do uh, object classification with clip. So I think you'd be better served by learning a specific captioning model that will generate a caption condition on an image rather than trying to extract captions out of clip. Just do the difficulty of the optimization or the search. Thank you. Um, so, like I said, we weren't using the text encoder in Dietner. In the next work, we try to um, move in an even more extreme direction of generating objects without any image data. So what if we only have a caption and want to synthesize a 3D object from it? Yeah, is that possible? Can we remove this mean squared error loss entirely and only use feature space losses? And these are some examples of the results we're able to get with different captions, like um, a render of a Jenga tower produces this object. You can also engineer prompts, use hashtags because Clip is trained on um, web data. Our goal is to synthesize 3D objects from just the caption. And to kind of refresh our memories, the neural radiance field is. Uh, inverse graphics approach where we have densely sampled images, optimize the shared scene representation, and then are able to render out new views. In the dream fields work, in the second work in this line, um, we do not have any observed images, only a caption written, for example, by a human artist. We optimize something that will look fairly similar to a diner with additional regularizers and then are able to render out new views. And any perspective is actually a new view because we haven't observed this scene. This is an associated scene for the caption, an epic wondrous fantasy painting of an ocean. So the neural radius would use this mean squared error loss and then diet nerf used a feature space loss where the rendered image of the scene and an observed image of the scene are um, encoded into a feature space that is optimized. Oops, sorry. Okay, now in dream fields, we use the text encoder of clip. That wasn't being used before. We were just throwing it away after trading. So instead of optimizing for 
similar feature similarity in image feature space. We now maximize similarity of image and text features. The reason we can swap between the text encoder and the image encoder is because Clip has learned an aligned representation. It has tried to maximize the similarity of representations of images and their associated captions. So those representation spaces overlap. And you can, in some sense, swap the encoders from text encoder to an image encoder and hopefully still have that aligned representation. But overall, the pipeline looks fairly similar. So let's randomly sample poses in the scene, render an image, and then try to make sure that its semantic features match our features of our caption. But if you apply that approach naively without any regularizer, then there are a bunch of artifacts. So, sorry. These are some example generations for different captions. I believe this one had something to do with liquid in a blender. Um, this one might have been a colorful bus with graffiti on it. So without regularization, we are getting degenerate scenes. And it's not surprising because there's really no data involved in this process. In Diet Nerf, the scene was regularized by having some input views. Here, the canvas is open, wide open. Um, so we, in our work, we added some regularization. The scenes are composited with randomly sampled backgrounds, and we regularize the scene to be highly transparent. So this transmittance loss encourages sparsity in the underlying scene. So instead of getting lots of low density, wispy content, like you saw in the previous slide, with a transmittance loss and this associated background, our motivation in dream fields is to create more of a consistent foreground object a single foreground object. And these are the renderings for that associated caption, washing blueberries. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of room to, for improvement because each of these blueberries is kind of mashed together with the others. The, the general caption has been encoded into this scene. And there's a consistent foreground object. This is the visualization of the process of optimization. Uh, in, in response to the question, um, Leandra asked, so it's creating this from one image. There's actually no images observed. There's only a caption fed to the system. So any images that I'm showing are rendered using our neural radiance field. They're completely fictional. I mean, some intuitive explanation for this is how can um, we learn a scene representation such that it could be captioned with a given caption from any perspective? Maybe that's how a human sculptor would approach the problem. So given a caption, like give me a, you know, a clay sculpture of um, a tower. Or let's say, you know, a monocular sculptor, <laughs> good optimize for a clay sculpture that is a tower from any perspective. Sorry, um, what happens? Sorry, what happens if the caption is something vague, like just a dog? How would your optimizer know that like it should have the same dog even from different poses or camera poses? Yeah, excellent question. The constraint that views should represent the same object from different perspectives just comes from the shared three presentation. So we're optimizing the same MLP um, from any perspective. Okay, thanks. But we had to simplify, well, we didn't have to, you're able to keep view dependence in the neural radiance field. So this regularizer ends up being kind of important. Like I discussed with diet nerf, you're able to learn a lot of these near field artifacts. Um, so sharing the scene representation is important, but some of the other techniques in our paper, like the regularizer, are also important for making sure you get a clean result. Um, in this example, we experiment with different caption templates to measure the uh, compositional generalization of the model. So the base caption template 
here is a teapot in the shape of a blank, a teapot imitating a blank. And then in the video, um, the caption beneath each object is the word that is filled into the template caption. So a teapot in the shape of an avocado produces this object, whereas the caption a teapot in the shape of a glacier produces something more ice styled. And um, oops, I'm sorry about these animations. If you switch the caption from an armchair to a teapot, you'll also notice some changes in the shape. So there's legs on this avocado chair, but when it becomes a teapot, the legs are removed. There's a follow-up question about whether the clip library is 2D. Um, yes, clip is trained only on 2D images. So just on 2D views. The motivation for using clip is that we can very scalably acquire caption images from the internet. If you, for example, look at Wikipedia and just look at the upper right image associated with each article, it has a caption beneath it. And there's a data set out there called Wikitext, which has about 11 million captioned images. The authors of Clip were able to collect an even larger data set by scraping websites other than Wikipedia. But if you look at data sets with 3D objects in them, they're very small. The largest might be ShapeNet, which is entirely synthetic objects. And there's usually no caption associated. So we'd have to have a human annotate. This is a general trend in the 3D reconstruction literature that um, the availability of 3D data is quite limited. And so in dream fields, we're able to exploit this um, pre-trained 2D image encoder and text encoder, and then kind of lift it up into 3D by using a shared representation of the geometry. There's a bunch of different techniques that we use to improve the quality of the results. I won't get too much into this, but the metric is a little tricky to define because there's no reference object for each caption. We only have a data set of captions provided to us by the user and we wanna measure how well um, our generations are performing. In order to do that, we use a neural, neural metric based off of uh, matching generated 3D objects against the input captions. So this is something like precision of retrieving the correct caption given the generated objects. Some of the most important techniques that help us here are um, our regularizer for transmittance and data augmentations, the architecture we use for the MLP. Um, and then later on, what model we use for CLIP. This is an example of the process of optimization from different iterations. So it actually can converge quite quickly, quickly but additional detail might be added over the course of training. In order to run 20,000 iterations of optimization, um, it's an expensive process because we need to render out these images during training. But back of the envelope calculation is uh, about three to four dollars uh, to generate each model on TPU uh, in Google Cloud at an hour. So it's kind of in the realm where you, an artist could afford to do this. We're working on some follow-up work, follow work, which will speed up this process and make it even less expensive. And that's all I've got on these works. The broad goal here is to make content creation easier and generate assets that are useful. So this 3D assets I see is particularly useful for downstream applications because they could be plugged into a game or plugged into some other system. And we have code out for both of these projects. If you want to try out um, the text to 3D generation in your browser, you can use a Colab notebook that I put together. I've tested it on the pro version of Colab, which has um, higher memory GPUs. So you might need to play with some of the parameters. Thanks. Thank you so much, AJ. Uh, this is really fascinating. Uh, I have a few questions, uh, and then before before uh, letting uh, you know everyone else ask question. The first question is that: um, Are you able to walk us through some of the collab uh, code today, or should we do it on our time? Um, let me see if I have it up. Okay, and so also before going to changing your screen, 
Can you please go back to uh, the uh, animations? Sorry, yeah. I have so many questions because this is really cool. So, uh, or maybe the one that is armchair. Yeah, give me one sec. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I think, I think these are really cool. Yeah, and I think that for the students and I, this kind of uh, inspires us to think, you know, maybe one cool thing to do is that we can generate these things and use them in some avatar or game or something. And this will be really cool. So this is something for students to think about uh, for their future projects. Because the, the goal of this course is to inspire us to think about what are the creative ways that we can use AI. So this is really cool. And one question that I have is that, do you have, can you share with us some intuition of, you know, for instance, let's say the rubric. Uh, it looks like a rubric and it looks like a chair, but then we see that there is some, um, we wish there was more of the structure and it might be because clip is the object objective uh, and uh, or assessor and thinking that okay as long as i have a patch of you know red and yellow and things like that that are appearing on rubric i'm happy the rest i don't care much or is there any better explanation of what's happening yeah so the um 3d structure only emerges because of the shared representation and the easiest way to satisfy clip from any perspective having this rubik's cube chair from any perspective might actually be to learn some consistent geometry that said there's no prior uh, other than sparsity and some implicit regularization just in the structure of the mlp so there's no no prior on the 3d structure learned from data and so that's something that i think is is missing and definitely an opportunity for future work is how do we learn some priors on 3D data and integrate them into the system to try to improve the plausibility of the structure. One, one example where this issue uh, arises is that sometimes um, you'll get repeated structures on the objects. Like if you optimize for a, a dog, maybe it will have eyes on multiple sides of its face because they're not visible. Um, so you only see two sets of eyes from any particular viewpoint that is all the discriminator clip ever sees are those two eyes but the underlying geometry there's no constraint that the the, the dog should only have two eyes okay excellent thank you so much are there questions before we go to the collab uh um the outputs are they like dot uh, fbx files uh, or uh, do they need, still need to be, let's say, uh, a little bit uh, prepared, uh, let's say, in a rendering software before they can be, you know, actually readily used in a game engine like Unity or Unreal? They do need to be post-processed. And so what you get out is a trained neural net. So this function mapping from coordinates. We don't use the view direction in these results, just X, Y, Z coordinates map to color and density. Um, so there are a bunch of ways that you could convert that. I, I don't know of off-the-shelf software that will be able to do that conversion for you it has to be coded up um, but you can sample the scene on some grid for example and then you'll get out color and rgb you could convert that to like a voxel representation if you want to get a mesh there's an algorithm called marching cubes that is able to um, find a mesh in the scene and there's implementations on github of marching cube for neural radiance fields though we haven't integrated it into our particular um, library. So you take a little bit of glue to grab marching cubes and then plug it in. So what do you all use to turn the neural net into these graphics? Sorry, could you repeat the question? What do you use to turn the neural net into the graphics that we see here? Oh, yeah. So that's done by rendering. So you can render the neural radiance field from any perspective in the code, um, but that just renders out a 2D image. It doesn't give you, you know, like a mesh versus the game engine will have its own rendering. 
algorithm based on rasterization or ray tracing, given the underlying geometry and texture map, um, which might be real time. So the rendering here is not real time. You have to go evaluate the neural network at a bunch of different coordinates and accumulate its outputs into an image. So that's implemented. If you want videos, we can do that, but <laughs> you'll have to DIY the conversion. Um, Ellie had a question on strategies to reduce rendering costs. So you can render images at low resolution. And in the CoLab notebook, the rendering is done at very low resolution. So experiments, you render out 168 by 168 images or higher. But CoLab only gives you a single low memory GPU. So we render out 88 by 88 images. And that really significantly speeds up the process. So rendering takes maybe uh, 300 milliseconds. And so you're able to do about three iterations per second. Um, if you're using alpha transparency, map the back. Oh, okay. So Ben is asking, how do we handle with transparent objects? Um, so the neural radiance field volumetric representation is really amenable to transparent objects because the density is this continuous value and we can observe objects. So accumulate color from objects behind transparent objects. So the optimization, you might decrease the density of some object that should be transparent, like stained glass windows. Um, the background is composited at the end. So any ray, if there is some accumulated uh, if the transmittance is not zero along the ray accumulated throughout the scene, then there'll be some contribution from the background image. So the reason that we kind of encourage coherent objects is that if the object is not coherent, then the background will leak through the translucent objects. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, that, yeah, if you want stained glass windows. So, I mean, you would have to, the, the scene would probably optimize so that the transparent object is blocked from behind by something. Um, yeah, the next steps. I think they're ex very exciting. Lots of next steps because this is an initial work, and there's things like speeding up the optimization. It's been a lot of recent work on speeding up neural radiance field training from images, and I think a lot of that can be plugged in. Um, how do you synthesize deformable objects? How do you bring a human in the loop so they can provide feedback partway through training? Um, all kinds of stuff to tackle in making this more of a practical system for 3D artists. And would you like me to share the collab? I guess we're at time. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. That would be great. Thank you so much. So this is the collab notebook. Um, you can find it from the project website. It, um, is a compact implementation. Um, uh, the system will run faster on GPU than on TPU in the Colab notebook. But for all of our experiments, we use TPU. Um, some helpers are imported from our library. So if you want to hack on some of the low level primitives, you can fork our library or kind of copy those helpers into the notebook. But the main way you'll interface with this collab notebook is by adjusting the quality settings here. Um, so in particular, edit the query. Here I've filled in a high quality 3D render of Jenga tower. And you can select the clip checkpoint you want to use. Clip bit B16 is used in most of our experiments. There's also an internal Google model that's not available here. But you can scale down if you're running out of memory to either the B32 or ResNet 50. Choose a number of optimization iterations. I think at least 1,000 is necessary, but more will add more detail. You configure the rendering width, and then this is the number of data augmentations. Um, and then run training. So here's an example of the training run I've already run in the notebook for that prompt, a high quality 3D render of a Jenga tower. 
It won't exactly match the result that was shown in the slides because the version of the Kolob notebook is scaled down. But over the course of 2000 iterations of optimization, you can see the different learning curves. This is the total loss that's being optimized. Clips cosine similarity, negative cosine similarity is improving. So this means that the renderings of the object are becoming more and more consistent with the given caption over time. And the transmittance regularization here, this is showing what is the average transparency of pixels in the scene. And um, in this plot at the bottom, the Colab notebook will write out renderings periodically every, I believe, 100 iterations. Um, so at the beginning, the scene is you know, low density, essentially empty. And then over time, some content will emerge from the optimization. And then that's refined and sharpened over time. The camera is moving around. So the camera is being randomly sampled around the object. And that's why the scene is rendered from different perspectives. And then finally, the Colab notebook renders out a video, 48 frames. And this is the result. Um, on the GPU that Colab gave me here, a P100, the optimization I think took about six, seven minutes. Yeah. So hopefully you can get some cycles in. Um, in the run training section, it says if you run out of memory, tweak the configuration options above. Um, what do you recommend uh, changing? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think you can change this clip at B16. I would try to clip B32. Um, there's also on the first import an NVIDIA SMI printout. And so you can look at how much memory is available. Sometimes it's worth retrying multiple times to get a larger GPU. This P116 gigabyte, I think you won't get without Colab Premium, which is about $10 a month. Um, but you think you can get 15 gigabyte T4 GPUs for free. Sometimes the Colab will give you an 11 gigabyte GPU. And that might not be enough. If you can tweak the configuration parameters, I would try reducing this number of samples. So this is the number of points along each ray that is sampled. And that affects the batch size. So the render width, the batch size scales quadratically with the render width because we're rendering the square images. And then the num samples, the batch size to the MLP scales linearly. So you could reduce this down to 32 even at the lowest. Um, B32 will use less memory than B16. So this relates to the patch size in the vision transformer clip encoding. Um, and then if you wanna scale down even more, you can change the number of data augmentations per iteration, maybe down to two. Oh, Ben says that you can't retry for a better GPU. <laughs> That's unfortunate. I mean, uh, I don't know whether MIT has like a shared GPU cloud, but you can also just download this IPYNB and run it on your like Jupyter notebooks, post it on some MIT compute. And it will parallelize across multiple GPUs. Cool. Um, I'm happy to take any more questions if you have. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> maybe at this point, I stop recording. And if students have more questions, we can.